happening now. We'd like to welcome our viewers from across North America and around the world. This is the EdTech Situation Room, episode 118 for December the 12th, 2018. This is Wes Fryer talking in a cheesier manner than I normally do, so I'll try to not weird you out. But I am so excited to be here on a very special episode of the EdTech Situation Room. Uh, this harkens back actually to... Gosh, years ago, uh, I did some shows with uh, with Karen Montgomery. Did we did the, we did we do the technology shopping cart at the end of the year? Did we did we did we do that uh, with Langhorst with with uh, Eric? I don't think we did. No, we I did. think it's the first time. Interview. Okay, so yeah. anyway, year. I don't know. It's been a while. Uh, we we did this idea of a technology shopping cart. So Wes Fryer, coming from Oklahoma City, director of technology at the Cassidy School. Joined, as always, by my good friend, Dr. Jason Neifer. Uh, probably the resource as far as geek gifts go for everywhere uh, north of the Kansas-Nebraska line, like just every, the whole nation. So, Jason, how are you this fine evening? I am super well, Dr. Fryer, and I am joining you tonight from Missoula, Montana, which is... Uh, the pride of Western Montana. I'm not sure what that means, but we'll say it anyways. And um, it's getting a little Christmassy around here. The weather is chilly, although uh, most of the snow for a big snow, snow dump three weeks ago has melted. And so now we're just trying to keep an eye on whether or not we will have a white Christmas here in a couple of weeks. Excellent. Well, normally we are here on Wednesday nights. We're here on Wednesday night tonight, but we're talking about the news through an educational lens. And you can find all of our show notes at edtechsr.com slash links. But tonight we're going to change it up a little bit. We're going to uh, talk about some gifts for that special someone in your life that might like something a little geeky. But Jason, I think you have a good piece of advice when it comes to buying for geeks. Uh, how, how would you recommend folks approach our recommendations and their buying for, for the geek in their life? Today. Well, it, it's important to understand that the geekier someone is about something, the more likely it is that you would have a hard time finding them a gift that they would truly appreciate. Now, to be clear, any gift is a great gift, right? Like when you're giving something from your heart, that's always a wonderful thing. But uh, if you have someone that is pretty geeky and they're super into something and they're really nerdy out over that special topic, unless you ask them for a gift recommendation or perhaps decide to go the gift card route, which is always a, a, a nice flexible gift to give then maybe consider getting something that's you know outside of their geekdom so that you know they probably have specialized things they like and you know not that your gift isn't special to them anyways but you know maybe consider not trying to find something if you don't have the expertise to get it and the thing that i keep thinking about is um i'm many varieties of geek but i'm not an audiophile i'm not really super into high-end or vintage uh, equipment i like the sound of a of, of a a, a an old record perhaps on a, a decent stereo system, but I couldn't really tell the difference between a decent stereo system and a super high-end stereo system. And your audiophile friends probably could, which means that is not a category to try to purchase something uh, interesting or meaningful unless you have the advice of another friend that has that geekiness themselves. Okay. Well, with that piece of advice, we want to give a shout out to Peggy George in our chat room. Definitely encourage anyone who is joining us live to uh, chime in in the chat room. Um, our Google Doc, which is linked from our normal Google Doc, tonight is editable. So Peggy, if you want to add anything or, or others uh, join us, uh, we are a small intimate audience here and we have not been trolled. We're not inviting trolls to come. But anyway, <clears throat> we've got that open as of tonight. I will turn that off for editing after we finish tonight's show. But here are the categories, Alex, Jason. Uh, we've got smartphone stuff, Internet of Things, books, robots, STEM, STEAM, miscellaneous gadgets, home network equipment, photography and videography, software, nerd paper gear, baggage, stocking stuffers, and other ideas. So, Dr. Neifer, where should we begin tonight? Well, I think the Internet of Things uh, section is a good place to start. And I we both dropped a couple of items in here. Um, I want to start off with that on the chance that that your nerdy friend or family member has not picked up a, a smart speaker. To be clear, not everyone is super into smart speakers because there are concerns, perhaps legitimate, perhaps not, uh, about privacy in these devices. But 
there are a number of great uh, 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 examples, and I the, some of them are, are really inexpensive for what you get out of the product. And so I'll start off with a good general recommendation, which is the Amazon Echo. Uh, the Amazon Echo is the most popular speaker available, and I noticed that mine just turned on when I use the A word, so it's listening to me right now awkward um but it's probably gonna talk to me here the marvelous what mrs a or what are are yeah yeah the divine miss a um and um the speaker itself uh is usually under a hundred dollars for the 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 pretty decent model there's a pro model that has some extra speaker internals to it i've not purchased a recent one i'm still on a generation one in fact i'm going to reach over for it and see if the cord's long enough to show it off and i have two of these bad boys in my home and um you can actually still find refurbished versions of generation one which are are dirt cheap now on places like woot but um ignoring the fact of 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 maybe the perception of creepiness of the devices they are excellent speakers that i think are really smart smart speakers from the standpoint of providing a, a an internet connected speaker um in your home and so in my house it's mostly for music it's occasionally to find out weather outside or listen to the news and then uh once in a while it, it can help uh you know answer a trivia question that might happen um at dinner time and uh last year's I mentioned on the podcast, we had an exchange student from Sweden. He would often ask uh, either Alexa or uh, a Google Home that we have in our home uh, about uh, translations of things. Um, one a side piece of advice, there's also the Echo Dot, which is a little tiny speaker. They're, they're practically giving these things away. The speaker component of the Echo Dot, dot is not super great, um, but for a nightstand or if you just want to experiment with it, they're currently on sale for $29.99 at Amazon. There's a link in, in our, our uh, special show notes tonight. And it'd be a great way to get started with a smart speaker. So my addition in the IoT category is the Google Hub Home. When Google had their event earlier this fall and they announced a bunch of new products, this was the one that was the most interesting to me. Um, we are not, as, as you are, Jason, a multi smart assistant family at this point. In fact, I think you have opportunity to give us some good advice about perhaps deciding, you know, which way to to go there when you're going to invest. Um, We have uh, four um, Google Home Minis. And so the Hub, pretty interesting that they opted not to put the camera on it, but this is essentially a smart tablet that you can put in your kitchen and then if you're going to, you know, for instance, uh, you know, use it to cook with, uh, you can have a video play right there and be able to see it. You can also use this as the hub of your smart home. And that's, you know, Google's play here, along with all, you know, I say all the other co- companies, Amazon, um, also Apple wanting to, you know, be be the, the center of your smart home. And so I guess I would say to all of this, um, well, I, I gave my parents probably a, about a year ago. Yeah. Cause they actually moved in, moved into their retirement community just before Christmas, um, gave them a, a Google home mini. They've enjoyed the music aspect as far as just being able to say, Hey, Hey G play me such and such. And it's fun to talk to. Um, I really, you know, people might wonder, well, why would we do this? This is the only gift on our list. I would say that is going to get better with time because the way that the developers are continuing to write code for the algorithms, the pro- the progression of artificial intelligence. I mean, this really gives you an opportunity to experience the march of technology in a very personal way in terms of the capabilities that it will have. And, and I'll say that, you know, I have today or, and, and every day, you know, interactions with the, the assistant, uh, you know, in the morning, getting ready uh, in the bathroom. Hey, G you know, good morning. And then I'm hearing the weather. I'm hearing uh, the news start in the the lineup of news items. Um, We do have one Chromecast in the house. Um, So this isn't as as common, but I can ask for a video on YouTube and that can be played or or a Pandora station where we have, uh, you know, Apple Music and we have, I have Pandora. So anyway, I'm not invested in the ecosystem of of Google's um, Google Play Music. But anyway, it really is an amazing thing to be able to with your voice you know command and have things happen uh we'll get you know hey what's hey g what's showing at this theater you know when can we see such and such um you know and and then it'll send things to your phone and 
So anyway, it's part of that Harry Potter experience that if you know the right words, and I'll, and I'll say this final thing, podcasts. For me, the number one way I listen to podcasts today is through my Google smart speaker. And <clears throat> there are still some issues when you go room to room and you change speakers. And, and I know, I've learned there's a difference between saying pause and stop. I think it's usually better to say stop, but it will pick up many times where I left off. Even on my iPhone, when I open the smart assistant app, and I'm in the car, you know, then it will pick up that podcast where I left it off and being able to skip with your voice and, and all that. It's just, it's phenomenal. So anything else that we need to think about Jason in the IOT category, besides possibly an echo dot, uh, echo, um, one of the, one of the generations or the Google hub hub home. Uh, um, I have three quick, uh, quick hit, uh, uh, gift ideas. If you know someone that already has one of these devices or wants to get really basically into smart home, um, this is not just my opinion. Uh, other sites that rank these things agree with me here on this one, but the Wemo smart plug is a really excellent device to get started kind of on internet of things. I have about a half dozen of these bad boys in my home. The thing I love most about it is that you can set them up to where they have a timer on them. So we'll turn the power off to the device after a determined amount of time. So in my office, I have, uh, two, um, sets of uh, uh, power strips uh, plugged into the wall. One of them is in a timer, a timer Wemo plug, and one is not. The stuff that's plugged into the timer one is everything that that it doesn't matter if it gets turned off. You know, after X amount of time, it just cuts the power off. So it's my monitors, it's my printer, um, it's my smart speaker, it's the things that you know. If I walk away, I would want them to go away to conserve power. And then my desktop computer, my laptop are on the other power strip. So they never get turned off automatically. So I would never lose data or anything. And so I have them set up to where after two hours, they just turn off automatically for the purpose of saving power. Um, the outdoor version of that is called the iClever Outdoor Smart Plug. Also works with Google Home and Alexa. Uh, said her name again. I apologize. Uh, the What I love about that particular device is that it's really hardy. And so I have a group of outdoor uh, kind of festival lights that are on a, a back patio that are controlled by that device. So I can turn them on with my voice or with the app. And then also these plug in to, I believe it's both the Amazon device and uh, the Google Home. But I've recently really loved getting into tiles. Uh, tiles are little pieces of plastic that have a battery and um, a Bluetooth device in them. I happen to have one that's sitting in the middle of my uh, kind of dollar bill wad in my wallet. And these uh, get hooked up with your phone and can identify the location of wherever that device is at. So I have one in my backpack. I have one in my laptop bag. I have one in my wallet. I have one hanging on my keys. And the tile app's amazing because not only does it tell you where it last saw it, it hooks up with other tiles users if you lost something in a location where you're no longer at it can tell you where your stuff is at if other tile users uh, happen to walk by that area and they kind of sniff out the tile pieces and those also work with uh the amazon and the google devices so tiles are super great too We'll hit this article perhaps in greater depth next week, but I, I did see an article this week that there is a new feature for Madam A to be able to respond to email, to read you email. If there's a particular person that you're waiting for an email message, then you can tell it to notify you. Wow, that kind of thing is pretty exciting. How do you recommend, Jason, for those that haven't taken the leap into the smart assistant world to decide specifically between, I mean, the Apple world is pretty expensive as far as that speaker. So if they're choosing between a, Madam A and Google Assistant, <clears throat> what's your advice? I would generally defer to the Amazon device unless you are incredibly steeped in the Google world. So for example, if you're a, a Mac Apple person, get get the get the amazon device um i using them both uh i think the amazon stuff is a little more advanced there's more opportunities to do stuff with that particular device and also i think the quality of the speakers are are better on the amazon side as well as far as third third party integration there's just more kind of like the app store for for apple Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, Google is, is catching up. It's not uh, 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 it's not quite parody. I'm sure there will be at some point, but I think Amazon's well ahead of Google at this point. Okay. Well, I'd like to take us to the category of robots. I know that you had dropped one in there. Uh, I do not think my wife is going to watch the show, so I can probably say this not too loud up the stairs, but she is really wanting uh, a robot for her classroom. 
And being able to have a physical computing device, whether you're thinking about your own kids or other kids of you know, family members, um, or, or you're thinking about your classroom as a teacher, uh, Seymour Papert, the father of educational technology, um, talks a lot if you read uh, his, his books and writing about constructionism. It's different from constructivism, so we won't go crazy on the pedagogy, but basically building something in the real world and then seeing a manifestation of the code that you do on the, the computer or whatever device, is it's a really powerful thing for learning. So the one that my wife is favoring the most right now is called the Edison Robot. And so um, the Edison Robot is at meetedison.com and that has the capability to you know, use a variety of different um, uh, you know, software tools, uh, and then you can use Bluetooth, and you know, the, the entry level pack there is, is uh, $50. So I am excited, and so this is a little personal interest too, we're gonna co-teach a uh, robotic physical computing class for, uh, I guess, third and fourth graders that's going to be in the, uh, the winter and spring. And so I think that's probably going to be what we'll, we'll do, and I'm excited, I need to go ahead and get that ordered. But I'm going to mention a few other choices one that a lot of people may not know about is called the Thymio robot. Um, I got to meet Sharon um, Mar Marzoak. I'm not exactly sure if I'm saying her name, last name right, but I can say Techie Kids because Techie Kids is, is her website. And I met her at the Atlas Conference in Washington, D.C. this past April. And so she spent years um, as a teacher and then she developed Thymio. And there's a lot of curriculum that goes with that as well. And it's a very flexible robot. It's at a, a more expensive price point. So it's going to be about $190 to $225. Um, but there's a lot of curriculum that you're going to get with that as well. Dash, which is a Wonder Workshop uh, robot, is a product of the Wonder Workshop and, and has a, a lot of great features in terms of, um, you know, bringing coding to life, you know, rolling around, being able to, to move, but, but probably not as much uh, flexibility as you'd see with the, the Thymio. Another one that my wife has mentioned, um, but, you know, I don't think we're getting this one, is the Ozobot. Um, and so the Ozobot is, uh, is priced at a, at a lower level. Um, but anyway, that's another one to consider. And then lastly, I, if you want to get out your checkbook uh, or debit card, as the case may be, uh, Lego Robots, you know, Lego continues to to do all kinds of things with, um, you know, not only just the building of, of traditional Legos, but with the ways that technology can interface both for young children and older children. And so I've put a link to the, the different building kits that they have. And uh, they've got a really good description of, you know, why should kids learn to program a robot? And so depending on the age of, of your kids, you can find a lot of different options that they have there. Um, but again, you probably are going to, you know, be, I don't know, you're, you can drop quite a bit of money on, on getting robots. And I'm only scratching the surface. So if you have a favorite robot that I have not mentioned, um, it's particularly one that would be, you know, useful in a classroom or thinking about kids learning to code, I'd love to hear what your experiences has, have been and, you know, what you really uh, recommend because this is a, an area that most schools, if they're not already having some kind of robotics experience for students, uh, different teams, different ways to compete. It's not all about competition, but this definitely is something that we need to be seeing just like we have sports and athletic teams and fine arts, you know, seeing an opportunity for robotics is something that we should be having, I would say, across the board as an opportunity for students. So Jason, any thoughts about those robots? And then I know you have more of a commercial uh, home residential option that you dropped in the, the links. Right. Well, uh, you know way more about robots than I do, Wes. I, I will say that this is an area that I wouldn't say I'm willfully ignorant in, but I've sat through a couple of vendor presentations, that's it. But I, I will uh, double down on the Lego recommendation. It is, uh, uh, the, their systems are, uh, can, can range into the very spendy, but it, it it's such a great platform, especially since it interfaces with, you know, 50-year-old Legos as well. So I, I think that company does a really great job of staying relevant in every decade where they're dominant. So um, I, I, my recommendation here, I took robots in a slightly different direction. I'm glad, Wes, you shared so many great classroom examples. Uh, the traditional uh, robot vacuum cleaner is the Roomba. Uh, these things have been around for a decade or so now. They're, they're nothing new, but uh, they're, they're becoming really 
great vacuum cleaners. That's what they are. Roomba's a, a robot vacuum cleaner. It could also be a robot floor cleaner. But almost every single review of this device uh, suggests that whereas there was an interesting parlor trick 10 years ago, they're becoming um, you know, pretty solid uh, performers in houses when it comes to kind of automated cleaning. And although I've never owned one myself, I have played with friends' Roombas, and it's something that that if my parents still let me buy them Christmas gifts would be the top of my parental Christmas gift uh, piece uh, because it, it, it is an effective uh, house cleaning device. And also, by the way, I believe connects to both the Amazon and Google-based home devices. Awesome. Uh, would you like to take us to another category, sir? Sure. Let's, uh, everything's just so geeky on this list. Uh, let's talk about, um, let's talk about a quick one, uh, bags for nerds. And by bags, I mean daily carry bags. And I have two recommendations here. First, to be honest, uh, you know, the nerdier your friend, the more likely it is that they have a strong view on the bag that they carry with them. It's something that it's a very personal decision for me. But I have two great recommendations that have been part of my kind of long-term strategy. The first one is I love tactical gear and it i i'm not well I, i'm not really i i hunt a little bit because i'm in montana and i i'm i'm, I'm in a hunting family uh, my wife's family likes to hunt uh but i like tactical gear because it carries geeky stuff really well my daily carry bag and i i've, I've had several of these now and this is the one i kind of settled on this is my 511 tactical uh, a shoulder bag, and I love this thing, right? It is really a hardy piece of equipment, um, and I actually uh, bought this one used off of my doctoral advisor, uh, Martin Horeji. Shout out to Dr. Horeji if you happen to be listening, because he does uh, a listen from time to time. But I love this bag, and 511 Tactical makes dozens of wonderful bags from backpacks to, to very large uh, uh, things for deployment. Um, and it has this, the Molly gear on it, which means not only can I hang pens off of it and add pouches to it, uh, it has a cell phone holder, which is too small for a modern cell phone. So it's become my tactical mouse holder. So I can, you know, here's my Bluetooth mouse that, that hangs off of my bag. And all the 511 tactical gear stuff is super, super sweet and would recommend that as a potential bag. And then another bag that's a little more traditional, they make really wonderful messenger bags and computer bags the Timbuktu uh, bag company uh, makes wonderful kind of urban style computer gear um, I take I take my daily carry bag or my EDC as the nerds like to call it um, very seriously and both those products have my high recommendation awesome well since you're mentioning gear under other ideas um, I've got a link to a learning in hand premium t-shirt from Tony Vincent and if you do not follow Tony Vincent he is an amazing educator and human being. Um, but he also has a great link on his site called Gear Used and Recommended by Tony Vincent. So it's simply learninginhand.com slash gear. So I'm not going to go through all of that, but I will say, you know, over the years, um, Tony has been a huge influence on my life as a teacher and educational technologist. Um, one of the gear links, and I'll mention this one, shout out, uh, is he has the Brother QL800 label printer um, on, his, on his list. I think the one that I have is an earlier um, iteration. I'll actually drop that one in the in the links as well. Um, wow, what a what a great uh, idea if you're teaching an, uh, a workshop to just print out a short sticky label, put yep. your shortened link to your resources and your Twitter and your contact information, give that out, and then people can put that sticker on their conference, you know, um, program or you know whatever they're whatever they're carrying that's paper based. Uh, that was a tip that I, I got from him a number of years ago. So yep. shout out to him there. Um, go ahead. And I've actually seen uh, the he's put out some videos before uh, via Twitter with uh, the things he prints out for that. And they're really it's a, it's a smart strategy and uh, quite clever. So I would assume that that almost every gear recommendation on here uh, is, is extremely well thought through and quite clever. Absolutely. Uh, let's jump over to um, let's see. Well, shoot, let's do books. Um, I put a bunch of a bunch of books on here. And, you know, some of these are not at all educational technology related. Of course, you can get them on a Kindle or, you know, a different kind of uh, e-reader if you want to read in iBooks and, and whatever. 
Apple's changed it to books instead of iBooks, by the way. Have you seen that? That's interesting. Maybe they're just cutting the eyes out of there. But uh, my top one is called Essentialism, the Disciplined Pursuit of Less by Gregory McCohen. Um, not everybody's going to be a place in their life where they can do this. Um, but in general, having some boundaries and you know, re recognizing the power of no and, you know, not saying yes to everything, especially with regard to technology. Probably a lot of the folks listening to this podcast end up answering a lot of tech questions at work. Sometimes we can find ourselves overextended with so many different things that, that people want to ask us to do. And if you want to help folks and whatever, anyway, it's important to have boundaries. So that is a fantastic book. I actually listened to it a couple years ago on Audible. Second one is called Art and Fear, Observations on the Perils and Rewards of Art Making. Love this book. In fact, I included that in my 2013, which is the time called Mapping Media to the Common Core. Uh, I'll be hopefully rebranding that as Show with Media um, this next year. But it's just fantastic thinking about creativity and risk and the ways in which we, you know, need need to have sandboxes to be able to be creative and to try out ideas. Um, and then a uh, third one would be The Book of Learning and Forgetting by Frank Smith. We're actually coming up on an anniversary of the death of a good friend, Bob Sprankel. That was a favorite book of his, uh, a fantastic book about learning and about the ways in which the brain, uh, you know, actually, you know, in an authentic way, not in a just schooly way of I can regurgitate this back to you, um, ap you know, apprehends content and ideas and, and really is transformed by that. So Jason, I know you've put a few books in here. What would you add to the list? Well, I uh, it's interesting. I, I I was involved in a discussion earlier today about uh, 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 the notion that uh, it's hard to, to be critical of books on places like Twitter. Uh, so every every book is awesome, right? Like that, that it's it's harder to everything is awesome. Right, the like Lego song. Well, and you know that uh, it's harder to to put a nuanced criticism in Twitter than it is to than it is to say you know it's really great. But if I were to talk about three books that have made a big difference for me, one a very recent one, and then two maybe a little more long term. Uh, first, uh, the the Dave Burgess book Teach Like a Pirate. I will admit I wanted to hate this book based solely on spec, right? Like the guy walks around dressed like a pirate, what a dork, da 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 da. da. And I had the opportunity um, earlier this year to help moderate a discussion um, as part of the, the Virtual School Leadership Alliance as a professional development book study, and I, I moderated one of the weeks, and so I was forced to to buy the book and 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 read it, and uh, very rarely do I find something that really kind of, I think, nails part of what a good, smart, uh, engaging classroom looks like, but if you really want to know what that, that that is, Dave Burgess's book is really amazing. I have not picked up any of the others in the series yet, including Lead Like a Pirate, but I am super interested in, in, in perhaps reading that maybe over the holiday break, um, but if you want some inspiration on how to create like a fun classroom in addition to an effective one, Teach Like a Pirate's it. And I gotta say, even the curmudgeonly teachers I know who are amazing classroom teachers, but you know, really aren't into this like make your classroom better by reading this book stuff part of what their magic uh part of why they're great teachers is described in this book um the second book i would recommend is the best book i think that's ever written about teaching uh from a cognitive standpoint like what a cognitive science might say about teaching it's it's uh, dan williams um uh why don't students like school it's a 2009 book that i read uh, uh, and the recommendation of a friend and then ended up reading uh, in two different graduate school classes and it is outstanding. It dispels a lot of myths. Dan Willingham is on the front of kind of arguing uh, against the focus on uh, learning styles. He's the guy that's really called out the where learning styles has gone. Uh, I also think it's kind of funny because he has an open feud with Alfie Cohen, which I think is pretty funny. Like he's said some very uh, pointed things about uh, uh, particularly the the homework book by Alfie Cohen, um, but this is an amazing book that takes learning science and puts it in a day-to-day -day classroom uh, uh, means, and you can get like cheap versions now, usually used copies now are, are, are well under the retail price, and it's probably sitting uh, in the public library right now. And then the last book that is a little more um, uh, maybe philosophical um, Getting Things Done is David Allen's productivity book. And I, I'm, I'm a self-help guy. I like reading self-help books. And I very rarely jump into any philosophy all in. But I oftentimes will borrow from many different philosophies from self-help gurus. But even though I can't, I can't pull off the whole David Allen system, it's, it's, it's too much mental bandwidth. 
for me. Um, I'm a big list maker. I am constantly, um, this is, uh, 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 and we'll talk about this a little later when we talk about nerdy paper gifts, but, you know, I carry along with me a, a daily notebook, and then I've got a series of to-do lists that I carry along with me that is based on the David Allen system, and, you know, I, I spin a lot of plates in my life, and his philosophies have really allowed me um, to to organize uh, my work, which is an incredibly important thing to me. So, you know, consider this year giving the gift of inspiration, which I think all three of these books do a, a great job of. Awesome. Uh, I have a couple more. Um, there's a book, and this is from uh, from our, my friend Lucy in Vermont. She's Tech Savvy Girl on Twitter. Um, the website is just soelectric.org. Uh, one of the things also we need to be concerned about in every single school is encouraging our young ladies to uh, get into coding and to also love math and to not give in to something that happens a lot of times in school. And that is that the guys are there in the coding class and they're, you know, doing gaming and it's not uh, any kind of, uh, of equitable situation where there are a lot of other um, young ladies and, and also just female role models, et cetera. And it's not to say that sewing is just for women. Of course it is not. Um, but the opportunity to, combine programming and electronics with textiles is definitely something that can be very appealing and it's not necessarily you know something that you're seeing in a mainstream you know coding class or something like that so that is a book called so electric shout out to lucy um and you should definitely consider checking that out and again just like robotics is a great thing to have in school you know we need maker spaces but we also need opportunities as lucy said um she and her and her husband passed through uh last week on their way to uh, arizona and their their snowbirds from vermont and she put it this way that you know girls deserve the opportunity to learn with a peer group and if you only have one or two girls in a classroom filled with guys yes there are maybe the the chronological age peers but uh, the, the dynamics are very different there. So that's something my wife is passionate about. And um, I'm excited, hopefully, to see a lot of young ladies in the uh, coding classes that we're going to have. I went ahead and put also a series of, of Neil Postman books. Um, I hadn't read this one, and I just actually started it last night, uh, Building a Bridge to the 18th Century, How the Past Can Improve Our Future. And as I'm reading this, it's been a while since I've read him. Um, the books I put on there were Amusing our, Ourselves to Death, Technopoly, The End of Education, Teaching as a Subversive Activity, uh, Really Great Pedagogy, pretty much written you know, before the internet age and, the, and certainly the age of, of fake news and what we're seeing today. I think it's really healthy for us as educational technologists to have a strain of, of, of Luddite you know, questioning. I'm not talking about rejecting technology, but definitely questioning technology. And so Postman can certainly help us do that. Um, I just love especially his focus on critical thinking and the way that we need to develop the capacity for, for everyone to have a, he calls it a crap detector, uh, being able to discern, you know, what to believe, what to accept, don't be sheep, uh, just, you know, accepting what you're, what you're ingesting. And he's talking a lot, especially amusing ourselves to death about television. So shout out to Postman. And then the last link is just to my Amazon reading, pardon me, reading wish list. Far more books that I would like to read than I will probably ever uh, make the time to read or, you know, have the money to purchase. Um, but whenever I'm finding a book that, you know, like you just recommended, uh, Jason, why don't kids, students like school? I haven't read that. So I just added that to my Amazon wish list. If you're not using an Amazon wish list, that is a, a great thing. Uh, of course, I think there was an article recently about the data that was being sold Amazon to different folks about wish lists. And then the ways did we talk about that last week that they were actually inserting into your wish list so that others would see it. Like this is even if you're going to share something like for a shower or whatever. Anyway, well, I'll find that article. Um, yeah, because that's not cool, right? You, you putting in an, an advertise, advertiser's link into my list so that anyway, that there's, there's some issues here. But in general, it's very nice to be able to say, hey, that's on Amazon. Boom, I throw that into my list. And um, yeah, that's that. it's also you know a way for you to probably get a couple hundred books that I have uh, encountered in the last couple of years that you know, some of which I've read and some of which I haven't, but they've, they've made the list. So where to next, Jason? Uh, let's do a quick run through home networking equipment. And this is another one that, you know, don't buy your nerdy friend. That's an IT worker at, at, at work. Don't, don't buy that, that, that person, you know, it, 
home networking equipment. But if you have someone that's a uh, an enthusiast, like this might be something I would buy for uh, uh, my parents who uh, have outdated networking equipment, and this would be an opportunity for them to get something very modern. But um, I'll talk about the first one, and then uh, Wes, I think you put the second one in. Um, I, for those of you that are longtime listeners to the podcast, know that that I moved into a new home in 2015, and it just so happens that I've had problems with Wi-Fi here, and I don't know if it's it's the makeup of the walls or whatever it is, but um, I fixed that by moving towards Google Wi-Fi, which is a um, uh, uh, a node-based system that you allows you to put as many nodes up in your home that work in what's called a mesh. And the idea behind the mesh is that if you put a number of these items together in where they can see each other, they'll create a really big Wi-Fi network that will allow you to have a, a great coverage by just adding another node to the mesh. And it's not cheap. Um, I have two of these devices in my home, so I paid, I think it was $100 a piece for them. But I went from having kind of spotty coverage in parts of my house to really covering, and I have a very long house, uh, covering my house really well. And so uh, it's a way to kind of create a really modern uh, networking system, especially if you have a, 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 a larger home that needs uh, a lot of coverage. Awesome. And I went ahead and dropped in the Eero. Um, you can read you know, great articles and reviews comparing these next generation mesh devices. We need to be updating the networking gear, the Internet of Things gear that we're having in our homes. Um, one of the most or probably the most important pieces, I mean, your laptop and, and your endpoint devices is critical and we need to have security patches and all that. But that home router is hugely important. And the Wi-Fi that's connected, whether it's an integrated Wi-Fi or it's separate, um, we need to be updating the firmware to that. We're just we're just not there as a society, right? I mean, the companies in general are not doing a great job making sure that we're aware of the security issues and and committing to security and updates, et cetera. As I've done some reading about articles, I mean, if I had the extra whatever four hundred dollars to drop, which I don't now, um, Eero is what I would pick up for our house. We're still on an older Apple what, airport, you know, not express, but uh, whatever, the time capsule. And uh, anyway, it's doing the job, but not only from a speed standpoint, but also being smart in terms of how it's laid out in your home. Um, Google Home will do some of this as well, like positioning three of these devices and then getting them in the best spots so that they're able to talk with each other. They have more channels. Um, you know, your old extender that you would do would end up using, you know, one of the radios just for the communication back and forth between the devices. And then, then when it's connecting out to, or sorry, it uses uh, one of those just to get back to the home base station. And, and anyway, it doesn't have as much capacity and bandwidth for your other devices. So it's going to be a lot slower. These mesh devices are a lot faster. They're more robust and they're also more secure. Uh, Google is doing a nice job pushing out security updates. Eero is as well. There's also some filtering, um, features that are built into these kind of things. So I, Ooh, I'm, I need to put on here actually the, the, uh, go did, what is it called? Shoot. Disney. I'm trying to say Disney go. Um, oh, geez. I just gave my, Oh, circle. Thank you. Circle. Yep with Disney. Um, that's a little hundred dollar box that you can put on your network. And if you have, uh, you know, children of almost any age that you want to take a look at what they're doing and then have some control over their different devices, that is the filtering box. So I'm going to, I'll put that in that same group. Um, but you've had the mesh for what, Jason, probably a, a year. How, how long have you uh, had the Google uh, Wi-Fi? A year and a half to two years, I think. And, um, and it's been really great. We've had no problems with any of the equipment and you're correct that, um, you know, we have the app installed on my phone and I'm able to see like it pushes me a notification every couple of months. It's updated and tells me what the updates are. There's new security updates. And, um, you know, I, I agree. I think it's a, a nice modern way of doing it. And the fact that it it seems to be a, a little more uh, automated. Right. Like I've obviously set some things th set things things up on it. But, you know, most of the most of the processes on there kind of uh, happen to deal with themselves. So I, I really like it. I think it's a pretty great thing. And, you know, especially if you have someone that's that's like a tech enthusiast, but maybe is using the router that comes with uh, 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 came from the cable company, you know, tell them to buy something else. Like it's it's almost certainly going to be better to buy something um, like one of these devices or a, a, a modern uh, controllable router. When we bought our circle for uh, by Disney, it was a hundred bucks. Now it's down to fifty five. So that's actually yep. actually good. Um, would you buy the same Google Wi Fi today, Jason? If you were 
uh, if you had an unlimited budget and you were purchasing again. Oh, what? Yeah, it's it's been really great. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's see. Let's jump to software. I got three fast ones here. Um, I have used the software Scrivener to write uh, books and eBooks in the past, um, and that is a, a great piece of software. Um, but the one I discovered this last weekend is called Scapel, and it's by the same company. So it's uh, literatureandlatte.com. Um, but Scapel is a, a program for your Windows or Mac computer, and it really is like a kind of high-powered mind map, uh, workflow, brainstorming, you know, throw your ideas down onto the screen and then see how you want to connect them and be able to share them. So I think that looks pretty cool. Another one that I put down here is ScreenFlow. If you've got a screencaster, a YouTuber in your world, I had the opportunity to introduce our now 15 and a half year old, Rachel, to um, screencasting. She wanted to, you know, set up a YouTube channel and that was a lot of Minecraft initially and then it's become Sims. And, she, and probably over the holidays, she'll do some more. Ninth grade gets busy, so she hasn't been doing as much. But uh, ScreenFlow is, in my opinion, the best screen casting and screen recording software on the Mac platform and uh, runs about $100 and is definitely well worth it. And the final uh, software item is actually a subscription, and it ties to what I was just talking about with YouTubers and publishing. Uh, it's called Epidemic Sound. And so I think Rachel was the one who discovered this. Uh, a couple years ago and basically we pay something like ten dollars fifteen dollars i should know this uh per month but what this allows is uh basically complete um copyright clearance yeah 15 bucks a month for all the videos that are published on a single youtube channel so her youtube channel is the one that we have tied to this subscription uh but she has you know what does it say 30,000 soundtracks and 60,000 sound effects. There are different places uh, and wonderful places that you can find some free tracks or Creative Commons shared audio files that you could put into uh, videos. But um, anyway, this is a great opportunity to talk about intellectual property and talk about copyright and those kind of things. And anyway, even though her production of videos has reduced our subscription to Epidemic Sound, or uh, yeah, has has continued, and uh, that that's a great conversation to have with anybody who is gathering around your holiday table, uh, and is a YouTuber. You know how how do you, do you get music to put on your uh, your videos? How do you find that music? How do you make sure you don't get a strike against your account, right? Because you can have three strikes and you're out, and then YouTube, you know, just cancels all all of your videos, and you lose your subscribers and everything else. So those would be some software tools. Jason, any other software to add or anything that's – that? because that's a big thing. We have all these free tools, right? We are big lovers of uh, Google Apps and all that kind of stuff. Is there any particular software tool that is a, a pay-for software and it's really one of your go-to pieces? Yeah, I would, I would say the one piece of software that is a non-negotiable for me, especially since I use cloud-based almost everything, is Snagit by TechSmith. And Snagit is is twofold. It is a a screenshot uh, grabber and annotator, which is a wonderful um, um, a, a wonderful thing to have, especially when you run a technical support desk. But it also has a great a screencasting feature where you can take screencasts of things and then edit them. And uh, Snagit actually recently moved to a uh, uh, once a year update. So now they, they have a new version of the software every year and it keeps getting more and more and more and more functional. Um, an example of something that, that I use fairly frequently with the newest Snagit is that you can take a, uh, take a, a, a piece of a, of a screen that's text that's not copyable. In other words, it's not, it, it's not available to copy and paste and it will use software, optical character recognition software, um, that uh, uh, on a, basically on a screenshot and pull the text out of there so you can copy and paste the text only into a document. So every time the software updates, it's great. I happen to have it at work. Uh, so uh, that is a covered piece of software for me. But if I were independent and working on my own, that's a piece of software I would buy all by my lonesome. Interesting comment by Peggy in the chat room. Uh, she said that an ad popped up on my phone about fast networking almost immediately after I clicked on your link. Uh, which was talking about Wi-Fi. Uh, yes, my comment was that is surveillance capitalism in action. <laughs> and we can talk more about that on another show because 
Yes, surveillance capitalism underlies much of the modern web and especially the free tools that we use today. Let's see. Um, quick smartphone stuff. Just a couple here. Uh, shout out to my sister, Trudy, in Liberty, Missouri. Uh, Thanksgiving, we're sitting around the table. And what do you have on your phone? Uh, she's got this ring and she has an iPhone 10 and she absolutely loves it because she doesn't want to use a case. You know, Steve Jobs designed the iPhone to be held without a case. He didn't want us to be shrouding our beautiful Apple technology, if we have that, uh, with, you know, plastic that, you know, a third party manufacturer has created, which is, of course, a huge ecosystem for different manufacturers. Anyway, I don't know if this is the exact one that she has. I'll, if it's different, I'll find it, but it's only $10. This is the Hummix phone ring holder stand and universal thin finger ring grip. That's a long thing, but basically it sticks on the back of your phone. And so you can uh, put your finger through that. And that is your insurance policy in not dropping your phone because you, you actually have, uh, you know, one of your, your, uh, hand appendages, one of your fingers through the, um, the, uh, the ring. So the other thing that I put on here was, uh, consider, and I talk quietly cause I don't think they're going to be listening to this. Uh, getting a used phone, right? It is wonderful. And I'm sure, you know, the economy and lots of folks are very happy when we buy brand new phones, but uh, smartphones have gotten to the point where I would contend it's freaking ridiculous to be spending, you know, top dollar, especially if you're going to be doing that on a regular basis. Some people have the disposable income to do that, but you can get really, really good used phones. And so the website I've linked is called Swappa. Um, I did put a link to the iPhones that are on Swappa. They've got a lot of other phones that are available as well. I won't disclose, but there has been a purchase uh, recently here that's going to excite one of the members of our family. Uh, not for me, but you know, the youngest one will actually be getting a newer phone than one of the older ones, and it's because of Swappa. So you do want to be cautious and think about where you buy your used technology. Um, I have heard this recommendation from uh, from Michelle, one of our librarians at school, who's had some really good luck with it. Uh, you can take a look at how many you know sales, just kind of like eBay and other things. You know, has this person this is the first time seller and and those kind of things. Um, they've got different ratings for the phones. Um, and then you're able to see where, what that phone is selling for, you know, so for that model with that number of gigabytes, you know, what's the, the range. And so I think it's, uh, pretty good to, you know, hopefully not get ripped off in terms of paying more than you should. Um, it's also a place that you can sell your technology. So if you want to do that either before the holidays or because you or someone in your family gets a new device, it's something to think about. Um, and that might be a way to recoup some money as you work out the smartphone ecosystem if you need to with your family members in terms of what gets traded back and forth and passed along and who gets what. Okay. I'm going to do a couple of uh, kind of, I guess, analog uh, gift ideas here. And, and I, before I was ever a computer nerd, I was a super paper nerd. Um, my, for my, uh, when I was uh, seven years old, my parents for Christmas got me a gift certificate for an office supply store in Great Falls, which I loved, by the way. I spent like four hours and they're spending 20 bucks in, in like 1982. But I've got four quick recommendations for you, actually five quick recommendations for you that are super great. Um, I'm a notebook guy. I like notebooks. Notebooks are really nice. And I love these. These are field notes. Uh, these are um, uh, I'm not handmade, but I guess I know hipster made uh, notebooks out of Chicago. Chicago, and these are spendy. I mean, that's the problem with them is they're they're supposed to be they're inspired by what's kind of they're called old seed catalog notebooks that when you were buying seeds in the 1930s and 40s, you'd show up and there would be little uh, notebooks that had advertisements on them for seed companies and you know farmers and ranchers would you know, keep them in their pocket and write data down in them. And Field Notes was inspired by that to create these uh, these field note notebooks and they cost about three to four bucks a piece um i i asked for this christmas from my in-laws a subscription uh to field notes you can buy kind of a quarterly box of them that have special editions and stuff but they're just little 24 page uh notebooks um and i happen to carry mine in this wonderful leather um 
uh, leather pouch that I, I purchased from uh, Etsy. Uh, uh, a person on Etsy sells these, and there are, are, are hundreds and hundreds of, of different cases of them, but I love my little uh, notebook uh, that is in here. It looks professional at a meeting. I think it feels nice in the hand, and um, you know, and every couple of weeks I change out uh, to a new notebook um, and, and, and utilize um, a, a new notebook each time, and then I catalog these. I have them numbered, and they're sitting in a box in my office so I can go back and look at old meeting notes or, or old things I jot down. And I love writing things down. I think that's something that's been very important for me. And there's a little bit of learning science in that, too. But this has been a, a great addition to my daily carry. Um, if you want an alternative to that, there's also a really nice thing from a, a kind of a, an older company. Um, they're called uh, Field Books, which are a little cheaper. They're about they're about two dollars a piece. You can buy them on Amazon. And the Elam Publishing Company, which has been making scientific and other specialty notebooks for decades and decades and decades, have Field Books. They're also really nice and high quality. Um, if you're looking for a general notebook recommendation, the Moleskin notebooks are super nice, um, and I highly recommend those you like carry on a larger notebook with you and they come in different sizes and then i also have two gift pen recommendations and i i am a pen nerd i'm not a 200 dollars pen nerd and i'm not quite a um uh you know a fountain pen nerd uh, although man it's tempting to get into that nerdery um, but the two pens that I, I really love to use, this is my daily carry pen. Um, it is a uh, Zebra F701 pen. It's an all-metal pen. They have great, uh, quite wonderful uh, refills. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice writing pen. It's great in the field uh, notes notebook. And uh, these cost, you know, uh, 10 bucks ish And it's a really nice pen. Um, and uh, I like the all-metal design. And I think, Wes, I, you probably saw when we've been face to face. I like to twirl a good pen. That's a part of my debate heritage, and I still love twirling a pen. And the metal pens are nice for that. And the other one, I, I had one, and then a couple of years ago, it uh, met an unfortunate accident. But the other cool kind of nerdy pen you can get are called the Fisher Space Pens. Uh, space pens are uh, the reason why they're called space pens is because they write upside down in zero gravity. If you happen to be spending a lot of time in zero gravity, but um, they're they're nice quality metal pens there's a, a number of models the one i like is the all black matte pen it's an 18 dollar pen um on on amazon and it's a really high quality pen and so uh those are all great kind of you know, paper nerd recommendations awesome um one other thing i didn't mention on the on this on the smartphone was you know <clears throat> at least Apple is replacing their batteries cheaper. You got to be where if, you know, if that's probably one of the biggest risks, you know, you may, you may yeah. get a phone and it may look great. Um, of course it may be also really scratched, but you know, be prepared that you might have to, you know, put a new battery in it. Uh, let's do a, a couple STEM steam labs. Um, micro bit. This is something that the, the BBC has actually developed. It's called microbit.org. I have not done a lot with this, but we are doing a lot at our middle school makerspace with microbit, um, the LEDs, um, lots and lots of different projects and, and code you can use. It's also really affordable. This isn't super expensive, so this isn't going to be uh, as pricey and costly as you know, one of the, the robots that I had mentioned before. And so you can go onto their website, uh, click on a variety of different um, manufacturers that are going to be able to sell you this and ship it to you. Uh, yes, of course, you can go to Amazon as well and just put in Microbit. And I think it's going to be something in the neighborhood of um, maybe you know $20 or something like that. Um, let me see. I should have that. I didn't put all the prices um, by those. So yeah, 25 bucks. So, you know, for starter kit, tw you know, 20 bucks, you know, it's in, it's in that kind of a range. Um, I also put a link to the Makey Makey. Makey Makey's should be absolutely mandatory for all, you know, makerspace, STEM, STEAM type uh, experiences. One of my favorite ways to see kids of any age use the Makey Makey is to have different kinds of creative game controllers. So students can create a game in a platform like Scratch, but then they can use aluminum foil or other kinds of conductive materials. Uh, when I was at eTech Ohio this last Jan or February of last year, um, you know, I saw just some awesome, awesome game controllers that kids, you know, had, had, had been able to make using their feet. Um, you know, of course, a lot of times just using hands, but very, very creative. And uh, you can, you know, 
use your imagination for input devices. And then Jay Silver is one of the guys who originally came up with the Makey Makey, and he's got another product. I've actually got this. This is just very whimsical and fun, but it's called the Drodio. And so um, it, it says, what is Drodio? Imagine you could draw musical instruments on normal paper with any pencil, a cheap circuit thumb thumb tacked on, and then play them with your finger. The Drodio Circuit Craft lets you MacGyver your everyday objects into musical instruments, paintbrushes, macaroni, trees, grandpa, even the kitchen sink. So it is just awesome. And, uh, you know, the folks at MIT are pretty smart. And so they've come up with some very, you know, wonderful platforms like Scratch for coding that are free that, that millions of, of kids and, and learners of all ages around the world use. Um, Makey Makey and Drodio are things that I learned about via the Lifelong Kindergarten Group Shout out to Mitch Resnick, M-R-E-S, M-Res on Twitter if you don't follow him. Uh, really all kinds of creative folks that are helping us develop our computational thinking skills and also just having fun using technology. You know, we can be very proud and open about our geekiness today, right? Because geeks are, in many cases, shaping the world and we're going to be continuing to shape the world and we want to help raise up a generation of ethical makers and creators and coders. And so these kinds of tools really have, you know, a lot of exciting potential in to, to the extent that they could certainly inspire students to be creative and think about the ways that their imagination can, you know, be manifested in the physical world. Jason, you've got a bunch of stocking stuffers. I know we're close to the top of the hour, but I definitely think we probably probably need to hit those before we're done. And then maybe we might have time for a couple others, but it's, it's about time. So what should, what should I hope Santa is going to put in my stocking this year? Well, I want to find some things that were cheap things that are, are well-made and of good quality that the general geek would like to have, even as just a side or a backup piece. So I'm going to start off with my favorite headphones are the Monoprice 8323 DJ headphones. They cost $17, and they are not only uh, 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 completely indestructible, they sound amazing. For $17 headphones, you can't get better. And I've had people that are admitted audiophiles tell me that, no, they don't counter the $800 headphones, but for $17, they are an absolute steal. And you can also buy, for just a couple of dollars more, those with Bluetooth on them. Uh, wired or Bluetooth available. The Bluetooth also have a wire in them as well. They're my favorite travel headphones because if they disappear, they get lifted. I leave them behind in a hotel. I go and spend $17, and I have a brand new pair. Those are the Monoprice 8323s, direct from Monoprice. Um, Monoprice also has two wonderful Bluetooth speakers. Um, I've seen one of these uh, in person, and the other one I've just read reviews. One of them is a very large Bluetooth speaker called the Melody Large Bluetooth Speaker. It is a, a super excellent um, uh, uh, a large Bluetooth speaker. It's 30 bucks. You can't go wrong for a $30 a large uh, desktop Bluetooth speaker. Their smaller Harmony Bluetooth speaker is also uh, excellent. This is the one that I've actually seen in person. It is currently on sale for $34. And if you go daily to the Monoprice website, at like every fourth or fifth day, they have a 20% off, 40% off, 10% off deal, and I'm sure they will before Christmas. Um, other great gifts, micro SD cards. If you know someone that's into digital photography or owns an Android phone, um, uh, uh, micro SD cards are great gifts and they keep dropping in price. I put links to uh, 128 gigabyte micro SD cards, great stocking stuffer, a 256 card, also great stocking stuffer. These things are down to the... Um, 128 gigabyte one is down to, to 20 bucks right now. The 256 is down to $45. I have a 256 sitting in my smartphone. I have like, you know, four or five weeks of music on my phone now, along with hundreds of hours of movies and television that I can travel with me on my Android phone. Great stocking stuffer. Um, I also have some cable recommendations. This one I bought really cheaply because they were on sale to get them uh, to get them going. And as it turns out, I wish they had these for USB-C or micro USB. This is the Monoprice jeans shoestring a uh, cable. It looks like uh, you know a shoelace. Uh, it's hardy like a shoelace, but it's a it's a, a lightning cable, and uh, it's a great uh, hardy cable. They've got metal interwove into the fabric, and it's really a sturdy sturdy cable and for what they're selling these things for which uh the last time i checked was about 10 bucks a cable not only is that oh it's 9.49 a cable right now for the smallest one um 
and just 1049 for the three foot cable. This is the three foot edition here. I bought these a lot cheaper when they were first introduced. I think it's worth it at twice the price. And Does it so, hold up though? I mean, is it going to go bad on me? Um, well, I've only had it for three months and this is a backup cable for me, but, uh, so far so good. And I will say, generally speaking, every monoprice cable I've purchased, um, has, has been there for the, for the, the duration of my need for it. And so that's been pretty great. Um, I also have three other power cable recommendations. They're the anchor power line plus cables available on Amazon, uh, USB C Apple lightning and micro USB cables. I can also say I've never had an anchor cable, uh, go wrong on me. And I believe those have lifetime warranties. So they'll replace them. Um, if it, it is, it's a worry free lifetime warranty. And my understanding is that everyone, um, uh, everyone that has uh, uh, gone for the warranty has, has received a new cable without question. The wonderful, wonderful cables. And then, of course, a power bank is also uh, a nice, nerdy gift. Uh, the one I'm recommending is the Anchor um, uh, the, the candy bar one, it's the, the little tiny power bank. I got a couple power banks, a uh, larger one that I carry with me right now. But every anchor product I've purchased is, has been really, really quite wonderful. And for 24 bucks for a 67 milliamp hour battery, which would fill up most smartphones twice, an iPad once, it's uh, a pretty great thing to have in, in, in your pocket, your purse, your briefcase, your backpack. Um, wonderful, wonderful item. And then one last quick recommendation. Um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, this goes back to the EDC or everyday carry people, but I purchased this for my trip uh, to Costa Rica a couple weeks ago, and I love it. It is the J5 Tactical LED Mini Flashlight. Um, it, it It's a nice, hardy flashlight. It has a... I think it's a AAA battery that's sitting um, in this device, and it's it's metal, which I like. I like metal stuff. I'm sorry. It's a AA battery, which is even better. Um, a AA battery sitting in the device. It's a wonderful, small, bright flashlight that fits well in my everyday carry bag, um, and... Um, uh, it's it's a I, this would also be a great nerdy stocking stuffer and you know in the era of preparedness you can never have too many flashlights sitting around. One thing I'd add as a little tip as you're shopping, uh, check the colors as well as links, uh, and then in addition to the Monoprice website, you know check Amazon. Um, I'm finding that shoestring Monoprice actually for three the three foot version uh, f with well, 100 102 reviews uh, for 849, but nice. the uh, one and a half foot version is is mysteriously like twelve fifty. So yep. uh, check your colors. That's something true for cases and things like that too. Uh, sometimes you can see some some differences. Sometimes that makes a big difference. Sometimes not. Uh, but you definitely do want to be careful about cables. That's why I asked if that one was going to hold out. We've yep. had some negative experiences, especially with lightning chargers, uh, and then some that just punk out and seem to not work. And right. probably have have some that we need to throw away. So. Right. My last ones are down at the bottom under other ideas. Uh, we did this a couple years ago for our son. We probably won't do it this year. Uh, but both Tesla and SpaceX have apparel and branded items on their store. So it's kind of a cool thing. Uh, you know, he enjoys wearing his, his SpaceX. There's a, there was a cool um, T-shirt that was uh, about terraforming Mars and, and Tesla. So anyway, that's just... Even though I think Elon Musk is having some trouble on some different levels, personal front as well as uh, you know professional, I think he's had some fines lately. You know those companies are phenomenal and doing exciting things. And for the geek in your life, that might be something cool to have some branded branded uh, material. Uh, really, just kind of a wild one. Embark um, has a dog DNA test kit. Now, on a very serious note. I would not recommend taking a DNA test. Anything can be hacked. Any information, no matter who has it, you know, can be obtained by somebody else. And it's just going to be a matter of time before we hear this is Wes's like, what, what, uh, you know, grumpy old whatever, you know, cur curmudgeon. Uh, we're going to just hear more and more about how you know somebody's denied insurance or something bad happened, you know, as a result of, of DNA. But. What could happen for your dog? Probably not much. And if you want to drop $160, you can get the full DNA workup on where your favorite canine came from and on their ancestors. I thought that was kind of a cool geeky thing if, if you've got some disposable income to do that. Uh, I also dropped a few personal links. So I have a video library subscription. I do generally a weekly video tutorial and I've been doing that uh, actually pretty intensely for the past uh, three months, but I've got 
a bunch of videos that go back further. Uh, so, you know, if you're wanting to be able to uh, hear more from from me specifically. Uh, that's been kind of an experiment that I've really been been doing for a while. Um, I've also got a store on Society6 with some of my favorite pictures, especially some that I took up near your neck of the woods, Jason, when we were up in the uh, Tetons and Yellowstone and up in the lovely country of Wyoming. Uh, actually, it's a state, but it does seem like another country. Uh, and then lastly, I put a link to some of my eBooks, which some of those are a little old, but Hopefully we'll be updating some of those. So anything additional at the end, Jason, that you would like to share and make sure people do not miss out on? Um, no, I think we've covered the thing uh, pretty well. I would give a, another uh, 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 plus one to the DNA kit for your dog. Uh, we have a mutt. Um, she's getting to be uh, somewhat ancient now, so we don't know how long, much longer she'll be with us. But uh, we picked her up at an at animal shelter in Butte, Montana. It's been the best dog ever. We love her to pieces. We lay in traffic for her. But um, she is a variety of mixes, it turns out. My wife bought me that for my birthday a couple of years ago, and it was totally delightful. Um, it, the report was interesting, um, and we uh, learned a little more, little more about some of the breeds that, that are in her ancestry. And it made a lot of sense, actually, by both her looks and her temperament. Um, and uh, the DNA thing was really interesting. Awesome. Well, Jason, where can folks find you when you're not here on Wednesday pontificating upon the truth that you can discern from the headlines for EdTech as well as your Santa recommendations? Uh, I am on Twitter at Tech Savvy Teach. Uh, I work uh, daily with the Montana Digital Academy, montanadigitalacademy.org, also MontDigCAD on Twitter. Um, and I also work with the Northwest Council for Computer Education. Uh, blog.ncc.org is the blog. Um, and also follow them on Twitter, ncc underscore ed tech, where we like to share pretty regular uh, interesting bits about technology and interesting things about classrooms. What about you, sir? Awesome. Well, rumor is we may have a face-to-face -face meetup coming up in February at the NCCE conference. So I think I'll hopefully be getting said airfare and things like that finalized this week. So uh, that will be exciting. I am W Fryer on Twitter, periodically sharing on speedofcreativity.org and will probably be um, updating, you know, some, um, some books and things like that in upcoming months because that's one of my objectives for the year. So we want to thank you for tuning in. Thanks to Peggy in our chat room. Thanks to those who've contributed uh, ideas. We'd love to hear from you on Twitter. Do follow us at EdTechSR. Remember to check out our show notes at edtechsr.com slash links. And until next time, we encourage you to stay safe, stay savvy, and good luck shopping for the geeks in your life.